Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Now our topic is knowing the Spirit. And straight away we come to understand that the Holy Spirit reveals Himself to us in a way that we can get to know Him, which means He's a person. He's not just a thing or an it or a mere extension of God or another way of saying that God is with us or God works in the world. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. The New Testament makes that very, very clear. Now, when we speak of the Holy Spirit in relation to Jesus, we're speaking about a very close relationship. We know that in the Old Testament, God the Holy Spirit inspired the prophets. And Jesus, being the great prophet of God, is also inspired by the Holy Spirit. But of course, Jesus is more than a prophet, because he, unlike all the other prophets, was able to receive the Spirit without measure. He is the only one who is called the Anointed One. Jesus is more than a prophet. He is the Christ of God. He is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the one who receives the Spirit of God without measure. Now, in this program today, we're going to be looking more deeply into what it means for Jesus to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. It means, of course, that Jesus is special, God's special chosen vessel. It means that God has given Jesus the Holy Spirit to equip him in his work, his life, in his ministry. But we'll also come to see that this means that Jesus is the one who gives us the Spirit in our lives. Now, just because we're born again, it doesn't mean to say we are anointed or that we are equipped for service. When the Spirit of God comes into our lives and anoints us for power, anoints us with power for service, that's when we're equipped. And so we see in many ways Jesus sets the pattern. He was conceived by the Spirit and then he also was anointed by the Spirit. And we need both of these experiences. And when Jesus stepped up out of that water and went to wherever the Holy Spirit came upon him as he was coming out of the water, in the water, or by the side of the water, the Gospels are there for you to see. However it happened, at that moment, Jesus left everything behind and he put himself unconditionally at the disposal of the Father, being baptized in dependence on God to reveal the next step for his life. And the Spirit of God comes upon him like a dove and he comes there as being baptized in the Holy Spirit. John's announcement is beginning to be fulfilled. Jesus has been baptized by the Spirit himself in order to become the baptizer in the Spirit. He became the bearer of the Spirit so that he might become the baptizer of the Spirit. And we see straight away the effects of Jesus' anointing. His anointing is unlimited. John 3 verse 34 is a very important verse. For he whom God has sent speaks the word of, words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. Suggesting that when the Spirit came upon Jesus, the Spirit came upon him without measure. This is an immeasurable anointing. Jesus' anointing is an infinite anointing. And from the moment of that anointing, People were amazed by Jesus because they saw him to be unlike other people. The first consequence of Jesus' anointing we read about in the Gospels means was that he was driven by the Spirit into the desert to do battle with the devil. His anointing meant they had to face temptations. We need to understand this. God doesn't anoint you for no reason. God anoints you with the Holy Spirit that you might do battle against the devil. It was as if Jesus, having been anointed, served notice on the devil, saying, Devil, I'm here, I'm manifested now, and I have been manifested to destroy your evil works. And the devil challenges him. You know about it. 
if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God. And the devil was challenging the identity of Jesus. The devil was challenging this anointing, but the devil lost. Amen? And the devil cannot stand before the anointing of God. Jesus went out filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, verse 14. He was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness, filled with the Holy Spirit. But Luke 4, verse 14 says that as he returned to Galilee, he came full of the power of the Holy Spirit. And the first thing he did was enter the synagogue in Nazareth and read from Isaiah 61 and say, Now I am anointed. This scripture is fulfilled before your very eyes. And he was able to preach with that anointing. And from that moment onwards, God was with him. And he went about doing good, healing all who were pressed by the devil. How is this possible? Because Jesus was now working in partnership with the Holy Spirit. That's one of the key points of this program of study. I want you to understand this. I want you to touch your heart today. I want you to take it in very deeply. Jesus partnered with the Holy Spirit. And you are to become the partner with the Holy Spirit. In fact, I will say this. The most significant decision that you can make in your work in the kingdom of God, is to submit yourself to the Holy Spirit's initiative. In fact, I'm going to say it again. I want you to take it down. The most significant decision you can make in your work in the kingdom of God is to submit yourself to the Holy Spirit's initiative. In other words, you become a partner with the Holy Spirit. David Jongi Cho calls the Holy Spirit my senior partner. Benny Hinn calls the Holy Spirit my best friend. We need to know the Holy Spirit, to fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and partner with the Holy Spirit. And when you partner with the Holy Spirit, you receive a supernatural ministry, and you take up the ministry of Jesus Christ. Don't ever, ever seek your own ministry. Five years I was a Pentecostal pastor until I realized I had no ministry. I was about to give up my ministry altogether. In fact, God said to me, go ahead, Colin, give it up. It was never any good anyway. You give up your ministry, and I will show you Jesus' ministry. From that moment onwards, haven't time to tell my testimony, but from that moment onwards, supernatural power came into my life, and I was moved by the Holy Spirit supernaturally with signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Spirit. It was a powerful release in my life as I realized that I was called to model my ministry on Jesus' ministry and indeed die to my own ministry and accept Jesus' ministry. His ministry is the model ministry. And if Jesus needed the anointing of the Spirit for his minister on the earth, how much more should we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit for the continuing of his ministry through our lives on the earth? Thank God, that's exactly what we've been given. Acts 1.8, Jesus said, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. You will be witnesses to me in all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Romans 8 verse 11 tells us that uh, if uh, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's exactly the same anointing, the same Holy Spirit which rested on Jesus resting upon us. God promised it. The Isaiah 61 anointing, the Luke 4 anointing, that Jesus had is exactly the same anointing that is available today. And we are called to move in that same anointing and to minister with the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's available for you today. Let me just say, every one of you watching this video today, every one of you watching these programs today, the same anointing that was upon Jesus is available for you. Jesus did not minister in the power of his divinity. He could have done that. No, he ministered in his humanity as it was anointed by by the Holy Spirit and with power. That's the Father's promise for you. That's the Father's promise for me. I want you to begin to read the Gospels in a new way. When you see Jesus ministering, don't you see, oh, well, that proves his divinity because he received the Spirit without measure. Of course, it does prove his divinity. And we don't minister in our own name and authority, but we minister in the name of Jesus under the power of the Holy Spirit. We are called to walk like Jesus walked. 
When you read the Gospels, you see Jesus reaching out and touching the eyes of the blind and healing them. When you see Jesus cleansing the leper, when you see Jesus ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit, that's a pattern for you. That's a model for you. You couldn't do it in your own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, as you depend on Him, you can do it and you can share in Jesus' ministry. So, let's look at Jesus' ministry then. And I want to show you four great themes or purposes which are emphasized in each of the Gospels of what Jesus came to do, what his ministry was like. First of all, he came to break the power of evil and death. Jesus' anointing was an aggressive anointing. We've already seen how under that anointing, the first thing the Spirit had him do was to drive him into the wilderness. Actually, the Greek word there is ekbalo, two words, out of and throw. God thrust him right out into the wilderness, thrust him out. The Holy Spirit thrust him out, threw him out into the wilderness. This is an aggressive picture. He was thrust out by the Spirit to go and do battle against the evil one. And when you are anointed, you will be called to do the same thing. You understand, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It's the anointing that moves against the evil one. He cannot stand before the anointing of Jesus Christ. In the ministry of the, in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus established the kingdom of God. He disarmed the evil powers of darkness. He preached a gospel of repentance. He taught his followers about judgment. He gave them clear guidelines for their behavior. As in this ministry, Jesus came as a mighty king, concerned to bring in the kingdom. He ruled over nature. He conquered demons. He healed lepers. He revived the dead. Demons feared him. Feared him. Storms were stilled by him. The people of God saw the king of Israel. They rejected him. Now, this is for us. If we are called to model on Jesus' ministry, we must move in kingly authority. We must confront evil powers. We must face disease in Jesus' name. We must preach a message of repentance, a message of judgment and obedience, just as Jesus did. And we will be concerned under the same anointing to confront people with the commands of Jesus Christ and share his royal effectiveness under this royal Holy Spirit anointing. So Jesus came, first of all, to break the power of evil and death. But also, secondly, he came to seek and to save the lost. Throughout his ministry, Jesus showed himself to be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, the one who came to serve and to offer himself as a sacrifice. That's what it says in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, and verse 45. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in Mark chapter 10 and verse 21, he called others to follow him. Look at this, verse 21. Then Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross and follow me. That's how Jesus spoke to that young man. Take up the cross, follow me. And so, if we are moving in the ministry of Jesus Christ, we will have that same desire to seek the lost, to touch them. Of course, by our service we'll reach them. We don't suffer sacrificially, vicariously for the sins of the world. Jesus has done that. But in the same spirit of sacrifice, we must reach out to the lost. Jesus did so. He came to save the lost, the needy people who are powerless to save themselves. He came to make atonement for the sins of all humanity. He came to act as a substitute for every man, every woman, and every child on the earth and to die on the cross in their place. And he came to bear God's wrath on behalf of a sin, sin-laden world. And the whole of Jesus' ministry, therefore, was colored by this cross that he carried and the cross upon which he was crucified. It's impossible to separate Jesus' teaching and healing ministry from the rejection that he endured and the cross that he suffered. He was anointed to go to the cross. That's his purpose in this world. And if we are going to embrace the same anointing, we must embrace the same willingness to sacrifice our lives 
in sacrificial service and wherever it's necessary to suffer for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Passages like Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 8 come alive when we realize that we are called to follow God's suffering servant. Philippians chapter 2 there is speaking about the life of Jesus Christ in, in coming to this earth and being a servant and suffering in the way that he did, being obedient unto death, even death on the cross. We we'll also not forget that the anointing brings us to the humble, gentle, self-effacing Holy Spirit. We won't be seeking power for ourselves. We won't be seeking power of God at all unless we're also prepared alongside that power to embrace the lowly service of Jesus Christ and to enter into Christ-like suffering. That is what the anointing will bring you into. Make no mistake about it. I'm preaching to you the whole truth today. This isn't just the fine print. This is the large print. The moment you are anointed, you're going to suffer persecution. You're going to suffer opposition and difficulty. Hallelujah. Are you still ready? Are you ready? You're going to go where Jesus wants you to go? Even if it's going to cost you your very life? The moment you are anointed, recognize this. You will be led by the Holy Spirit on a path of suffering and a con of consecration, maybe even the suffering that Jesus endured. So we see, Jesus came to break the power of evil and sin, number one. Number two, he came to seek and to save the lost. Number three, he came to show a life of perfect consecration to the Father. Jesus was not just a king and a servant. He was also the ideal human being. He is the Son of Man. He is the ideal human being. He is God manifest in the flesh, the perfect example of humanity, the pattern for all humankind. And as Jesus lived his life filled with the Holy Spirit, we see the model for our consecration to God. Notice, Jesus was tested in every possible way. You are going to be tested. Amen? Amen? Yes, you are. Jesus was tested. You're going to be tested. He was subject to ordinary conflict and emotions. You're going to be subject to ordinary conflict and emotions. These are part and parcel of ordinary everyday life. But the moment you are anointed, they become more intensely part of your life because God will be shaping you, touching you, and making you like Jesus. Yet remember, throughout all of these conflicts, Jesus remained without sin. Jesus was the sympathetic friend of sinners and a man to be followed like that. Our anointing will drive us closer to sinners, drive us away from sin, but closer to sinners. Jesus loved the sinners. He ate with them. He ministered to them. He loved them. He embraced them. He helped them. He taught them. He healed them. He accepted them. He forgave them. The anointing won't make you such a holy person that you'd separate from sinners. It'll make you a holy person that you separate from sin, yes? But that anointing will drive you to be friends of sinners. Jesus was on the side of the lowest members of society. He constantly warned of wealth, the dangers of wealth. He demanded generosity to his followers. You cannot serve God and mammon. He stressed the need for forgiveness, urging his followers to forgive others and to and he practiced this self on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's where the anointing will take you, my friend. But don't think that this is all about having faith to open the eyes of the blind. Yes, it is that as well. But it also is having the anointing to live the way Jesus lived, to demonstrate the love of Christ to a lost and suffering humanity. If we model ourselves on Jesus, we will live with his holiness as well as his healing. And with the authority he gives us, yes, we will also serve with his compassion. So we see Jesus came to break the power of evil and sin, number one. He came to seek and save the lost, number two. He came to show a life of perfect consecration to the Father, number three. And number four, he came to show us what God is like. Jesus came as the living word of God as the unique and complete revelation of the Father, the invisible God. And so, he came to reproduce that nature and character within, within us. That's how and why the Holy Spirit 
directed and empowered Jesus. And so, when we see Jesus' life and his ministry, it shows us that we are called also to obey God as king. We are called also to allow the servant nature of Christ to be reproduced in us. Uh, it, it also asks us, that anointing upon Jesus shows us how that we are to follow Jesus as the perfect man. It shows us everything about the Father. And so everything Jesus did and everything Jesus said revealed to us the presence of God. And he did this over and over again by emphasizing his oneness with the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I've come to show you the Father. So time and time again, Jesus explains that his words and deeds were not his own, but they're the words and deeds of his Father. So when people looked, watched Jesus minister, when they listened to him, watched his life, they were seeing God in action. And so through Jesus Christ, we know what the Father is like. And we know what the Spirit's like because Jesus is an, the Spirit is an, another comforter. So the character of the Spirit is the same as the character of Jesus. So when we see Jesus, we get to know about the Holy Spirit, we get to know about the Father. And we also get to know what we should be like. And so, in the same way, the Holy Spirit wants to direct and empower your life and my life and your ministry and my ministry so that we should be able to point people to the Father. And when the Spirit is God. When we are filled with the Spirit, we're filled with God. We are in Him and He is in us. And therefore, we should radiate the presence of God to others. So Jesus is anointed. He is the anointed one, the anointed one. But He came also to disciple others. He didn't come just to keep that anointing to Himself. He came to disciple others. Now, discipling means that you become like the one who's discipling you. Jesus came that he might reproduce his life and his ministry in other people. And that's why he spent three years on the earth teaching his disciples. There came a point in the Gospels where Jesus withdrew very much from public life and spent most of his time with his disciples. He chose 12 men and poured his life into them. He taught them. He lived with them. He ate with them. He demonstrated ministry for them, and he said, now you have a go, and he helped them and showed them. This was the disciples' training period. The Holy Spirit wants to take you through exactly the same process. The we are to follow Jesus. Yes, we are disciples of Jesus. Where is Jesus? He's in heaven. What has he done? He sent his Holy Spirit. So his Holy Spirit now stands in the place of Jesus. The Holy Spirit has been sent to represent Jesus. So we follow the Holy Spirit. And when we follow the Holy Spirit, we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And when you learn to follow the Holy Spirit, you will find yourself being discipled by the Holy Spirit, or at least is discipled by Jesus through the Holy Spirit. It's most exciting. Every day is a lesson. And you are, have you entered yet the Holy Spirit School of Discipleship? Have you entered that yet? If you haven't, enroll today. This is how you enroll. Say after me, Lord Jesus Christ, I enroll in the Holy Spirit school of discipleship. Teach me, train me, direct me, fill me, equip me, and show me the way. Amen. You're in. You're in. It's a commitment you make to submit yourself to the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, oh, He will train you. He will train you. The most important thing is to learn to listen to His voice so that as you listen to the voice of the Spirit and, and follow the Spirit's promptings, you then begin to move under that same anointing. And so, Jesus we see in the Gospels sends out his 12 disciples. He calls them and sends them out to minister and gives them power to heal and power to raise the dead and power to preach the gospel. He also sends out other groups of people. In Luke 10, we read 70 or 72, depending on the Bible version, 70 others who were sent out to live and minister the way Jesus ministered. And so we see Jesus Christ training people up 
as his disciples to go out and minister with his ministry. And all that happened while he was on the earth. But then, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, just before Jesus leaves, he says a very, very important thing. This is the Great Commission, the last command. Go therefore, Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, listen, as the Father has sent me, so I have sent you. He sent me to seek and to save the lost. He sent me to disciple you. And he sent me now to build you up. And now I'm going back to the Father. And you have to carry on my job. And what is my job? Go and make disciples of all nations. And just as the Father was with me, so I will be with you. How was God with him? Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them, teach them, disciple them, and I will be with you. Meaning, it is a commission to be accompanied by the Holy Spirit. He will be with you by the Holy Spirit, teaching you, helping you, using you, anointing you, empowering you in this great commission. You are called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ like that. And in the next session, this is the end of this one, the next session we'll come back right to that point and take it further. But for now, let me give you something to think about. Jesus is calling you to be his disciple. That means you must be like him in his life and in his ministry. Die to your own ministry. Take Jesus' ministry. Take Jesus' life. And you will find yourself ministering with the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. And we will be back for the next session. And that brings today's teaching to an end. And I pray that God has blessed you and he will continue to bless you as you go through this series on knowing the Holy Spirit. And I pray that God will bring you closer and closer to this wonderful third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. So till next time, goodbye and God bless you.